Yeah, well, I think a number of things uh, need to be said. First, Russia is not the Soviet Union. Exactly. Post-1991, exactly. post yeah. Russia is not the Soviet Union. Uh, Germany is not uh, Hitler Nazism. <laughs> you know, times change. No. Yeah. So exactly. just to say <laughs> that it's the same is completely absurd. In fact, the, the whole point of the European community and then the European Union was it can be done better than it was done in 1914 or 1939. So there was an open door in 1991. But it was we based... Waste, we, of course we, we wasted it. Of course we wasted it because it was based on the idea of mutual respect and a common European home. Yeah. And Gorbachev and Yeltsin were very clear to Bush and Clinton, look, the Soviet Union is over. The Warsaw Pact Alliance is disbanded. Don't take advantage. We want normal life and normal relations with you. Ah, the United States can't have that. You just have to bow down, get on your knee. We are in charge. That's the U.S. approach. So the U.S. blew it, and Europe, uh, the European leaders, didn't have the gumption or the wisdom to be clear about that. Now, having said that, let me say that Russia swallowed a lot for a long time because in the first wave of enlargement, which was Poland, Hungary, and the Czech Republic, the Russians protested, but first, what could they do about it? And second, it, it wasn't existential for them. This is Central Europe. This is not Russia's border. But they said, you lied to us. Stop. Then the United States continued in 2004 with the Baltic states, with Slovakia, Slovenia, Romania, and Bulgaria, right up uh, against the Baltic Sea and the Black Sea. Now it's no joke. But even then, you know, the Russians didn't say this is a cause of war. Uh, and incidentally, by then, in 1999, NATO had bombed Serbia, Belgrade, for 78 straight days in 1999. It had unilaterally withdrawn from the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty in 2002. The CIA was running jihadists in the Caucasus region uh, for further destabilization in the underbelly of uh, Russia and all the rest. Even then, Putin was saying, come on, are we going to cooperate? And in 2007, in his famous speech at the yeah. Munich Security Conference, he said, enough is enough, stop. And in 2008, of course, George Bush came right back and said, okay, Enough is enough, Ukraine and Georgia. And then the coup in 2014. So we don't have maturity, self-restraint, or honesty. And we blew it as a result of this. What was an open door is not an open door. The idea, I was there, I heard President Yeltsin was sitting straight across from me, literally in the Kremlin, or I was sitting across from him. And he was saying, we want to be a normal country. We want to cooperate. We want to have peaceful relations. Not we want to be a vassal state of the United States, or we want a U.S. unipolar world. So, by the way, just to say, uh, even if you take uh, whatever Central and Eastern Europe desired of NATO, or even the Baltic states, had we shown some prudence when it came to Ukraine, which, if anyone understands geography and history, is existential for Russia, yes. just to not have the U.S. on their borders, if we had shown even restraint as late as 2008 or 2014, or even 2021, this would not have happened. And by the way, if we had shown restraint in March 2022, when Russia and Ukraine 
initialed a peace agreement in Ankara, Turkey. And then the United States stopped it. And they stopped it because the agreement was based on Ukrainian neutrality. And that's not me saying it. That's David Arakamia, the head of Zelensky's party in the Ukrainian parliament, saying it. That's the Turks as mediators saying it. <laughs> this is, this is uh, even Jens Stoltenberg, Secretary General of NATO, says, yes, this is a war of NATO enlargement. And NATO will enlarge to Ukraine, he says. Stop it. It's over our dead bodies you're trying to do that. Stop already. But they don't accept that because the U.S. doesn't accept limits. That would show our weakness. Yeah. We have to be all powerful. We have to prove to China how strong we are. This is American nonsense, not European wisdom. Is it coming elections? Do you think something can change then? Can can you give us some hope? No. If... <laughs> <laughs> no, because look, we have uh, two unsuitable candidates mm -hmm. as the two lead candidates. So we have uh, an 81-year-old president who is absolutely physically not up to this job and has basically been, uh, of course, doing all of these things, supporting the military industrial complex. And we have Donald Trump, who we know is uh, absolutely unstable. And who knows what he wants to do? Maybe, maybe he doesn't care about uh, NATO, but uh, he'll go to war with China. Who knows? This is America is in an unstable situation. And Europe should know better. Europe should understand that Europe needs European security. Europe's not about to be invaded by Russia, so this is not something from one day to the next. But Europe needs to rediscover diplomacy. Europe actually needs diplomats. Diplomats mean people who talk to the other side, not who go buying arms on the world's arms markets. So that's what Europe needs, not to wait for a better U.S. president, but to say, Europe, 27 countries, the cradle of Western civilization, and 450 million people, and a $20 trillion economy can stand up and find its own way. That's what Europe needs to do. Totally true. Yeah. We, we see, um, uh, of course, the crisis of leadership, not only in the United States, but also in, uh, in, in Europe right now. Uh, we have the European uh, elections uh, coming. I think it w would be very uh, surprising. I don't, I don't know what is uh, coming out of it, but um, I think uh, people are starting to realize that we can't go on this way. I don't know how it will um, uh, express itself and, uh, and politically, but uh, I think there is a change uh, going on. Um, so, so let's maybe we can uh, finish off to reflect a little bit on uh, on the future. Uh, so, um, what do you 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 help this? Uh, uh, of you you, um, you you stress the importance of diplo diplomacy. We were we have been talking about this on our channel for almost two years. We we didn't see anything happen, of course. Um, so it's it's but but is there a chance? That that the diplomacy is 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 becoming um, influential uh, when when there are some political changes in Europe going on. What what do we need to get this um, di di diplomatic uh, process uh, get started? You know the uh, the, the simplest would have been uh, that uh, the EU member states uh, had a shared understanding that there needs to be diplomacy. Of course, it's tough. The Baltic states are completely alarmed. Poland, yeah. which I advised uh, for a number of years, <coughs> completely alarmed. I think misunderstanding the whole point, you don't provoke your neighbor. By the way, the Latvian president tweeted, if I'm not mistaken, tweeted uh, that Russia needs to be destroyed. Uh, yes. Russia, Delenda, S. Yes, 
uh, you know, uh, Cato, oh, Cato yeah. tweeted that. That's a president of a country of Europe. No. So the no. first thing is spot that. Twitter is not a game. Calling for Russia's destruction, by the way, a neighbor with 6,400 nuclear weapons is not a game. This is not a joke. This is not clever. This is really imbecilic. Yeah. It's got to stop. So Europe, first of all, just needs to get in a room and say, we, we're we going over the edge this way. This is crazy. Everyone needs to take a deep breath and stop throwing the provocations and the insults towards Russia. And then to start an open discussion. But what, when are we going to do that? I mean, uh, when you take a, a last last week, there was this um, uh, uh, this 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 action of the Pope who was saying that uh, Ukraine should raise the white flag and come to come to the table. So um, he was criticized uh, about this. Um, so so what exactly uh, is it going to bring us to the to the table? What what is you know, uh, very pragmatically, uh, I, I don't know if anything will, but very pragmatically, Russia's elections are over. President Putin has yeah. been reelected. That means that there's an opportunity for actually having some meetings. Then uh, a very interesting uh, development in the Bundestag in uh, Berlin, uh, where the head of the SPD said, you know, maybe we should have negotiations. <laughs> Uh, and uh, that is, as far as I know, a first for the SPD. I've been waiting for that basically since uh, Schultz came into power. Uh, then uh, Putin is saying we're open for negotiations or discussion. My own view is uh, that as a very pragmatic matter, uh, Schultz and, and, uh, uh, and Putin should sit down, not negotiate, but just have a talk, clear the air, and uh, try to find some areas where we could proceed diplomatically. It's too much, and especially you can't be one one government anyway. Uh, and he's got his own uh, problem, Schultz, with his uh, most militaristic greens. But aside from that, just the, the president of Russia and the chancellor of Germany should sit down and just have a discussion, no expectations, no grand outcomes expected, but just to open a discussion so that we don't go completely crazy. And especially after the interception uh, of the, uh, the, yeah. the discussions of the four generals, it's really time for that. So that, to my mind, could be a very first useful step. So the key, the key lies with Germany, huh? Well, I think pragmatically, time. Germany's not going to determine the fate of Europe, but it's not a bad place to start. You know, I I might have said a month ago, yeah, Macron can go over, but after all the things, no, I don't said, think so right it now. Makes, <laughs> it makes it makes absolutely no sense. But maybe if the SPD is uh, coming to understand, oh, this is not working, uh, and I think Schultz does understand this because. He has been constructive in recent weeks, saying we're not sending Taurus missiles. Uh, yeah. The head of his party has said maybe we should look for an opening. My point is simply open a dialogue. Don't expect too much immediately. But at the end of the dialogue, don't throw insults. That's all. Yeah. Open yeah. a discussion that doesn't lead to further war, but actually leads to some ongoing diplomacy and the normal people of course are are afraid of what if they don't do that they should be afraid i'm all i'm afraid yeah uh, it, you know because uh, i know both as a participant uh, in intergovernmental affairs and as a student of uh, foreign policy history terrible mistakes get made Accidents, miscalculations, misjudgments, idiots in government, by the way, who are galore. And so <laughs> you have to be active for the good outcome, not simply passive 
waiting that some something good can happen. You really have to push for the good outcome all the time because you never know when the stupidity is going to take over.